Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I'm your host for today, Suman. Joining me are my colleagues, Ritul and Shri Krishna. Today, we'll be discussing the Chilean constitution. Chile is far away in South America. Why should a constitution, new constitution in faraway Chile, really interest us? Well, for all of us, a constitution is the building block for a country, for a republic. So when that foundation is changed, it is important to understand what brought about that change, what are the changes it seeks to bring in, and the ramifications for the rest of the world. So to begin with, Sri Krishna, can you give us the context to the new constitution of Chile? Sure, Suman. Thank you. So to briefly recap what has led to the changes in the constitution of Chile today, why a new constitution is being proposed and going to vote very soon, which I'll talk about later, it all started back in October 2019. So in October 2019, the metro system, the subway system in Santiago, one of the biggest cities of South America and also capital of Chile, witnessed a fair hike. Once this fair hike was announced, a lot of protesters came out on the street against it. And this protest, which began in Santiago, also spread to many other cities. So was this protest only about the fair hikes? Actually not. These protests were about certain changes in the Chilean society over the past decades, and these issues were coming to fruition. So what were these issues? The protesters talked about things like deep inequality, lack of economic opportunities, heightened living costs, and rising debts in their lives. Also, you have to note that the pension system in Chile which provides social security to the large group of population, was broken. Similarly, the health and education systems had become dysfunctional. To just contrast this with the overall economic situation in Chile, in 2018, just before the protests of the 2019, OECD had done an economic survey in Chile, which had actually praised the overall economic management. It had said that the macroeconomic stability in Chile is something which other countries in Latin America should look forward to. However, it had also noted that there is a deep inequality in terms of wealth distribution in the country. 1% of the population in Chile controls 26.5% of the country's wealth, while 50% of low-income households access only 2.1%. Considering this socio-economic situation, the protests spread and became popular over days. This forced the president of Chile back then, Sebastian Pinera, to do some firefighting and he announced something known as the New Social Agenda where he tried some reforms regarding pension, wages, taxes, etc. However, the protests continued to intensify. And finally, on November 15, 2019, the National Congress decided to sign an agreement with the protesters that a referendum would be held on two questions. The first question is whether you want a new constitution. And the second question was who should write this new constitution? Should it be a new constituent assembly? Or should it be a mixed assembly where some of the electors would be the existing lawmakers? On the two questions, the voters give a majority, in fact, a super majority, in favor of writing a new constitution and also in favor of having a new constituent assembly to do the job. And the voting percentage in favor was around 78% for both the questions. This shows that majority of Chileans were overwhelmingly in favor of having a new constitution. Uh, Shri... If I can interject on this, I understand that these guys are trying to solve socio-economic problems, which which has led to a higher inflation, more in inequality, largely the problems, some of it related to the, the neoliberal economic model. But how does going back to drafting a new constitution sort of pave the way for solving these problems? I mean, this could be through a political coup. They could form a new government. I mean, why do you require, or, or per se, if there is something really faulty, they could probably make some amendments, but why do they have to go back to an entirely different constitution? Yeah, taking up on that, these are policy issues. Yeah. Should policy issues be framed in a constitutional context, which will get hard-coded, right, to that extent? Yeah, and if you keep going back to people mm. saying, let's draft a new <laughs> constitution, I mean, there's just no end to it. Like, anytime a society is in turmoil, you draft a new constitution. Sure. So for that, we need to actually go back in time 
to around in the 1970s and the interesting political and social developments which took place in Chile. So the first Marxist president back then, Salvador Allende, was assassinated in 1973 in a coup d'etat and a military dictator, Augusto Pinochet, was installed as the ruler of Chile. And he ruled with iron fists. He was infamous for the you know, human rights abuses which took place, for the political repression which, Chile, which became common in the Chilean society. At the same time, the current constitution of Chile in the 1980 was actually drafted during the regime of Pinochet. And this constitution was heavily influenced by what is known as the Chicago School of Economics and neoliberal policies which spoke about economic liberalization, privatization of state-owned companies and reduction of inflation as well as deregulation and privatization were an integral part of this older constitution with sort of directed state agenda and economic policy to that extent. And of course, there are differing views on the success or failure of this constitution, which has, by the way, been amended many times henceforth. However, the thing remains that despite the macroeconomic progress which Chile witnessed, also the economic growth over the years and reduction in absolute poverty, the issue of inequality and lack of access to public facilities like health and education has remained. And the Chilean people today feel that they deserve a better deal. So the constitution of 1980 has become a favorite punching bag and people feel they need to start afresh and unless they do that, it is very difficult to change tracks. Okay, so this whole constitution which was drafted by the, which is influenced by the Chicago School of Economics, which is the free market, Milton Friedman idea of it. Now, there is a resentment that the text has not delivered the intended benefits to the society and that is why they need to go back, they need to go and write a new text. Yes. That is correct. All right. And then, so can you talk about like how this movement sort of came about, the the movement to write this new text? Sure, definitely. So once the Constituent Assembly was elected, they decided to sit down and draft a new constitution. And the thing about this assembly was that it was highly representative of the Chilean society. Which in one way actually negates or, you know, is a counter to the point that constitution writing bodies are not representative enough. Like there's a common criticism for the Indian constitution too, that it was written by elites and did not reflect the sentiments or the wishes of the lay people. That is one, you know, one view. So considering this is more representative, what are the things that, you know, they could have, what, what are the things you think they have done differently? Definitely, that's an interesting question because Indian constituent assembly was drafted in a particular period of time when India was going through transfer of power. And India was more invested in finding out a solution which helped complete the transfer of power and unify and stabilize the country because the partition was happening. There was a lot of disturbance and we had to hold together. However, this in Chile today presents a unique opportunity because this is an internal turmoil and there is no external threat as such. So the people have decided to elect an assembly of 155 members who wrote the constitution, who has prepared the draft of the constitution. And this body is highly representative. It is composed equally of men and women. There are around 17 seats which have been reserved for the indigenous groups of Chile. And this is also reflected in the way certain provisions have been drafted. For example, this has highly progressive rights when it comes to health, education, right to work and so on. And there are also certain interesting tidbits in this constitution. For example, indigenous people have greater protection. They have access to nature. They have access to community participation. As well as something very unique and all the constitutions worldwide today, which is that this constitution also provides some rights relating to climate change and environmental destruction. So, of course, this is going to be put to vote again. And the fact that this constitution will be voted in a referendum on September 3rd next month also shows that there is participation by the people. It's not done and dusted as soon as the Constituent Assembly adopts the constitution like it happened in India and elsewhere. After the draft has been prepared, this is again being taken back to the people and their views are being sought in a referendum. Yeah, it's interesting that it has sold that many, I mean, a few million copies. 70,000 copies, copies have been, of 70,000, 70, yeah, yeah 70,000 yeah, copies. Some large think, number so. of copies. Who it's, a, in, it's a text in demand. Yeah. yeah, who would have thought that a constitution of a country would be read by that many people? So that is that is really interesting for me. From I think that's that's also that also stems from the fact that it's written by the people. So in, everyone's in, interested in, in the knowing absolute what is sense. Yeah. yeah. So, but but thank you, Shri, for for taking us through the history of uh, the emergence of this constitution. With this, let's take a break and come back to something even more interesting. Yeah. At this point, I'd like to just mention that applications for the new cohort of the GCPP are open, 
and the new cohort begins September 3rd. You can make, you know, you can make a choice of specializations. We offer specializations in the advanced public policy, the tech and policy and defense and foreign affairs. So do head on to our website, school.takshashila.org.in and apply for our courses today. We'll take a short break now. Welcome back. We're discussing the new Chilean constitution. And uh, Shri, I want to get back to you when you said that the new Chilean constitution provides for transformative rights such as right to climate and ex digital rights, etc. So I want to take a step back and actually discuss the history of constitutionalism. This stems from a brilliant article in, in The Hindu by Gautam Bhatia. And he talks about that from the early 19th to mid 20th century, constitutional drafting across the world followed the United States model, which was, it was believed that the purpose of constitution was to constrain state power. And to this end, constitution across the world were, were following things like enforceable bill of rights, clear demarcation of power between the three wings of state, which is the legislature, executive and judiciary. And then later half of the 20th century, it came to understand that this vision of constitutionalism was necessary, but it was inadequate. So it wasn't really solving the problems countries were facing. It was then constitution began to include socioeconomic rights, such as right to housing, education, health, among others. And this is when India also saw a lot of amendments, 42nd Amendment, 44th Amendment. And again, around the same time, they also realized that the complexities of the governance require a set of independent institutions who could act as a watchdog to the essential cogs of the government. So this is when you had new institutions coming up, like... In Talking of checks and balances. Yeah, yeah. So so watchdog institutions started coming up, with Information Commission, Human Rights Commission, Electoral Commission, so that the basic tenets of the state remain in check, apart from executive legislation and judiciary. And while this, this, improved the, it, this improved the integrity in functioning of the state, but it was recognized that the, that the democratization of the society hasn't really happened. And it was then that, that it realized that we need to take democracy to the grassroots level, which is when the essential requirement of public participation. And we know it well, 73rd, 74th Amendment came out at the same time, which is when we had the Panchayati, uh, Panchayati Raj. Raj Act and the urban local bodies. So, so this is a brief history of how constitution emerged from constraining state to involving people's participation. But now we are seeing a new sort of new era for constitutions wherein we're actually taking into consideration the gravity of climate crisis or how how a big big tech is controlling over our minds so the so the freedom of cognitive thinking etc so these are certain new things which i want to ask you both that is it time that constitutions across the world should one include it? We've seen an Indian case as well in the Puttaswamy judgment. The Supreme Court said that it's fundamental right. Privacy is a fundamental right. So what do you think? How do you see the evolution of constitutions in terms of contemporary problems? For me, it's a bit of a mixed bag in the sense that while the constitution, while we set out to write constitution to restrict the power of, of the state over us, what we have also done is we have entrusted the state with a lot more responsibilities. Because we say that, you know, they have to guarantee certain rights, right right to, you know, food or whatever else we talk of. There is an inherent, you know, contradiction as such in, in that in that framing, right? So while, yes, we have to limit the power of the state, if you're for, expecting the state to follow a rights-based approach, that means we are also giving out a bit more of our freedoms to the state because we're expecting the state to fulfill certain obligations for which it will take away more rights from you. Also, I feel like, you know, all these constitutions or the progressive constitutions, as we like to call them, they seek to bring about a social revolution. The Indian constitution too sought to bring about a social revolution in terms of either gender, caste, or any of those ills that we had at that point in time. To what extent has the constitution actually served that purpose, which is, a societal failure and not so much a state failure. The state can, you know, can do something towards it, but largely societal ills have to be solved in a societal framework. So we have to make that distinction between the state, the, you know, the state and society at that point. So 
I think that balance we need to bring about in any constitution. I agree, right. but but Suman, it could also be that uh, societal failures can also stem from the fact that the text was written as such that, or maybe it was written in those times, or maybe the power elites in those times mm. were, you know, were of a certain bent of mind. So, which is, which could be that it does not fit in the contemporary. I'm sure there are like, do you, do you guys know of any constitution which was written with a certain mindset, written with certain certain set of power elites, but but it does not. I think to... I think this debate is interesting, especially in the context of the U.S. and in the recent debate over abortion rights in U.S. So there is a school of thought in the United States which believes in originalism, right? They like sticking to the text of the Constitution. So they believe that this document, which was written by the founding fathers, should exist as it did. And judges have no job sort of trying to rewrite or add provisions to these constitutions, which did not exist in its original text. However, the idea of a living constitution believes something to the contrary. They talk of constitutions as a living document, a breathing document, which changes over time to reflect the current socioeconomic realities, so that it does not remain frozen in time. So these two competing schools of thought are, of course, represented in the liberal justices and the conservative justices of the United States Supreme Court. And this debate is not new to India also. However, India has over time adopted, especially in the era of public interest litigation and so on and so forth, India has adopted a the living constitution model and we are constantly trying to improve the workings of a constitution from a judiciary-led approach. However, this again needs to be distinguished from what happened in Chile because this is completely new. They are trying to, after 40 years of the previous constitution, they are trying to write a constitution afresh. So that's a, that's a drastic and a remarkable step. And of course, it is speculative at this point. A lot of people have their doubts on the prospects of this new draft which the Chileans have come up with. Like for example, the economist has been highly critical of it. They have said that this is nothing but a wish list and, you know, trying to fulfill, yeah, a woke liberal wish list. And trying to fulfill all these rights will lead to fiscal instability and uh, will push Chile down a crisis. However, this is speculative at this stage. I mean, there is past experience which can justify either sides of the debate. But without going into it, at this stage, it still remains to be seen. All right. I just want to take a step back again on the rights-based approach that should constitution be be actually involving these new things in the society from a rights-based point of view. Now to look at right to protection from climate change, that, that can go, I mean, that in any way is, is very ambiguous and that can, that can go to any extreme, like who do you pin the blame to? It could be coming from across the border. How do you settle international disputes? So how do you, and plus, plus like when you go from the right right-based based discourse, one is that it will be fulfilled at a cost, at a humongous cost, which can the state even provide for? You know, to sum up our discussion, I think, I mean, of course, these questions, are, there's a lot of thinking to be done. But what we can provide you is, what I can tell you right now, is a framework through which you can probably address the questions that you were raising. So, of course, the first question is to ask yourself whether it is time for the constitutions to evolve in order to incorporate and codify rights such as rights relating to climate change or any other such right, including, say, privacy or digital rights. But Shri, any government will easily go for it. But the real task comes in actually fulfilling those rights. I mean, even in Indian exactly. context, the Supreme Court very, very candidly said that, you know, privacy is a fundamental right. But we've seen the data protection bill exactly. is in a limbo. Yeah. And there is no intention on the government's part to even move it forward. Yes. So I think which brings me to the second leg of the framework. So if you manage to answer the first question in the affirmative, agree that these rights should be codified, then you need to ask yourself three questions. So the first is, what should be the form and content of these rights? So unless there is absolute clarity and very little vagueness of what these rights constitute, you cannot move forward. The second is, what should be the nature of corresponding state obligations in relation to these rights? And this should also answer questions of fiscal duties of the state and the timelines for actualization of these rights. Should it be a minimum core approach where there is only a limited part of the right which you fulfill? Or is it a progressive realization approach where over a certain longer time frame, the state fulfills its duties vis-a-vis -vis these rights. And lastly, the third one, I think it's the most important one because this talks about remedies. So what should be the desirable enforcement mechanism in relation to these rights, which allows the citizens to seek redress for violation? So, I mean, like handing out a right without giving an effective remedy is like giving you a gun without bullets in it. So unless we thrash out the right uh, remedies part well, we are not going to see the success of these rights. As much as it is, it's still quite complex. Like, how do you really design design rights based? You know, so so yeah. Thank you for that. My last and final question to you both: 
is uh, is both societal and uh, and at a metal level why do you think constitutions fail like it's france has written some some third fourth constitution nepalis have not been able to agree to it pakistan has been struggling why do you think constitutions fail and and because considering we are in the month of azadi ke 75 mahotsav might as well talk about what makes our constitution to have survived the test of time i think again we should go back to the constitution assembly and what ambedkar said that however good a constitution may be if it is sure to turn out bad because those who call to work for it happen to be a bad lot <laughs> okay so you can write the best constitution but if the people who are you know who are actually working on that turn out to be of not great intent or do not understand that well i think we are going to face that thing but having said that by and large we've done a decent job of course we see slippages often and we hope the institutions live up which you know i think is a is a very optimistic view of the institution itself of the institutions itself given the way some of them have been going in the last few years so that's i think take. i think i think i agree with the, the ambedkar quote that you just mentioned and it is also important to be cognizant of the fact that the duties towards constitution towards upholding it towards enforcing it towards seeking accountability also lie with each of us as citizens yeah and i think the success of i don't know what makes it fail but i think the success is definite a contributing factor to success is definitely the people's participation their awareness their constant demand for rights questioning and holding the people in power accountable yeah and i think pertinently for indian constitution the fact that it's been a living document it's been amended at times when it was needed yeah, over 100 times yeah 100 <laughs> i don't know 3 4 yeah, what, yeah. what's the current, current amendment running so yeah it's it's a it's a living document it's amended when it's needed and and we should have review committees reviewing constitutional progress and see its workability and, and i think definitely the 75th year of independence so far it's been a great success in terms of its durability in terms of its strength however i think maybe it is also time for us to start reflecting on what yeah. the path ahead should be especially in the context of new problems which have arisen like climate change or digital right true and fulfillment of all the socio economic rights which the original constitution had promised so i think 75 years is a good time to sit back and take a deep look true true and i think it will remain to be seen how the chilean constitution one if it is accepted or or not and two if it is accepted then how it fares out actually how wh- how the actualization of these rights play out are constitutional courts actually sort of abiding by it and i mean this is this is very at a very meta level broad right but once codification of laws come in i think it will be interesting for us to to watch how this landscape evolves i I'm, i'm hoping <laughs> the economist fails and this thing works out but yeah, yeah but i yeah. don't know what what do you guys think september 3rd <laughs> is the date we look forward to all right thank you thank so you. much thank you thank you for being with us if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media the handle is at @ivmpodcasts on twitter facebook and instagram and hey if you'd like to dive into takshashila's research on technology strategy and economic affairs check us out at our twitter handle at @takshashila_inst or our website takshashila.org.in